Welcome to another edition of GovTech Today. I'm Russell Lowry. And I'm Jen Seha. And together we try and bridge the gap between .com and .gov. Uh, we have a very special episode today. There's been an explosion of interest in data, uh, you know, with the, with ChatGPT. It seemed like it was sort of a um, an iPhone moment when we just knew, whoa, this is different. Um, and we've talked about that a little bit. We've seen some of the AI conversation that's gone on in state government, but we thought we'd bring on a special guest to help us do a, a little deeper dive on data as it's having its moment. And, and rather than talk to someone who found out about ChatGPT uh, six months ago, uh, we've, we've got a special guest who has been in data for 30 plus years and has been thinking about this and has kind of has a unique take on what this moment means or a more substantive take. Uh, so Jen, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, happy to. So this is Athel Smith. Athel works with me day in and day out. Incredible intelligence from this guy. I, I'm going to make him blush right now, but he's really been a game changer for my business and frankly, for how the business community looks at data and how we use data as it relates to government. So I won't talk too much. I'll turn it over to him to tell you more about himself. So Athel, uh, we mentioned 30 plus years in data. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit about your relationship to data? When did it start and when did your interest start? Yeah, I, I mean, I started out in mathematics and, you know, I'm very involved in patents and things like that. And then when I first went to work for the government um, in Australia, um, it really became obvious to me the size and the just a huge amount of data that was being stored and, be, and being used and not being used. And I was very fortunate at the time that you know, I was put in a place where we had to do statistical analysis on data, and that was when I first really got my feet put to the fire on how much I didn't know about data. And, um, and it was very sobering, uh, but a great learning experience. And uh, from that point on, through every aspect of the career that I've had over 30 years, data and understanding data and the context of data and what business problems it solves has been really at the forefront of everything that so, I've worked on. So how was data stored when you when you began your career? What was what was it what did it mean to store data? Yeah, I'm gonna date myself a little because okay. <clears throat> Microsoft Excel didn't exist <laughs> uh, back then. So when I first started it was on a what's called an IMS database, which was a hierarchical database. And it was very complicated. It was an old IBM system. And you had these massive strings of data. And it was actually stored in, in hexadecimal values. So it even made it even more complex in how we used it. So, I mean, when I started working on that, it, it, the, the size of our database on the mainframe was just incredible. You know, I'd go to mainframe data centers and there'd be just rows and rows and rows of these big disks and tape. You know, and, you know, at the time you know, when I was working for my boss, I'm like, well, there's got to be a better way for us to utilize this data rather than spend 14 days to go through this data. If we work out, you know, how we store the data and how we, you know, we can optimize how we use the data. And that started from there where we started getting into, you know, very early on models of data. So how do we store it? How do we use it? How do we categorize it? Right. And so if it was stored on a tape, um, how would I know which tape I was going to, what I had and where, how to find it, how to use it? How did that work? Yeah, it was even worse than that. <clears throat> um, sometimes it, it, it wasn't stored. It was printed, Whoa. Um, which was basically impossible for us to deal with. So Really what we did is we created these indexes of the tapes and we categorized the type of data that existed on the tapes. And, you know, in the very early 1990s, they created these things called tape silos. And they were little cartridges that would get automatically loaded. So you'd have a database which gave you the index and the categorization of your tapes, of your data. And then back in the day, we'd have to manually load those tapes. And... Then we got these auto tape silos, which I thought was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And it could, load a it could load a tape within a minute. 
you know, from these tape silos and our storage tech silos and they were incredible. And then obviously we got more spinning disk and we got, we got better as we did it. And then I moved to um, a different organization when I uh, had patents and trademarks. And patents and trademarks is very data driven because that was when I first learned about data around images. So you can actually mathematically map images with data to do trademark infringements. And that was really the biggest learning curve I had on data is not just ABC, it's ones and zeros. Got it. And so well, let's fast forward. Uh, how is the state storing data today? Is it, uh, I mean, we still have mainframes and and the, the and I'm not sure you might know <laughs> more, uh, you might have more data on this, but I've seen an explosion in cloud spending across state government. So we have mainframes and this exploding cloud storage. How, what's the state of data today in state government? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's there's three, I think, there's probably three primary areas of how data is stored. Now, you've got the historical stuff that sits on tape, which they send off to silos to keep for 18 or 20 years, right? So, and that sits out there and it's stored in a vault somewhere and very rarely used. A lot of organizations are trying to take those tapes back and put them on disk. So if you look at how the state itself has three kind of repositories of data today, they've got mainframe data, which sits on a specific type of data, um, at hardware and then you've got the cloud data so everybody's used to oh I can buy data from AWS and I can buy data from Azure or Google or whatever and then you've got on-premise data now CDT uh, has storage as a service and they break their data into four tiers so without getting into the technical nuances of, of what each tier is from product it basically comes down to how fast do I want to retrieve that data so there's types of storage which allow you to retrieve data in very in nanoseconds, milliseconds. And there's other data which will take a little bit more time to retrieve. And <clears throat> understanding how, what, that makes it even more important that I know what data I want to store because if it's fast retrieval, it's expensive, right? It can cost up to 20 cents a gig for data. So if you think about how much data we st we save and we store, it's petabytes and petabytes of data, that can add up to a, a huge amount of money that it's costing each department to store their data. And a lot of the folks are, um, are very smart about optimizing what type of storage they use and how they store that data today. If I'm an agency, uh, do... I know how much I'm spending on storage. Do I have a storage spending budget? Do I've spent through my retrieval money? I need to quit asking questions of my data. Is that or a, is that like a... if someone changes the fees I have to pay, what do I do then? Right? Say AWS's prices go up or Google's or Azure. <clears throat> yeah, those prices change and they can change on the amount of volume. So if you look at the rate that data expands. Right. And if you look at the data today versus the data in five years, you're going to be see a significant need for the amount of data I need to store. Right. So I would say on the most part, um, you know, a lot of storage folks in, at the agency, certainly that I've worked with and dealt with, and I'm, it's, it's probably about 40 or so here in the, in the state, um, they've been very wise and very smart on determining how much data they need today and forecasting the capacity of growth of that data. So you will see that they're, they're very good at forecasting the amount of budget, but if pricing changes, and so if I have on-prem storage and I've bought a big storage box <clears throat> and I know how much I've got, I've paid it. I'll just pay my renewals and I'm good. If I have storage in the cloud and it's say it's a penny a gig, right, for long-term storage, if that went to 1.2, that's a lot of money. And I can see some of the use cases, and then we're going to pivot a little bit here in just a moment, but I can imagine some of the use cases where how many, how many agencies three years ago were planning on uh, AI implementations that might look at all their data to and and in order to generate 
uh, and answer questions that policymakers and departments might be having. Was you may, were you aware of it? And do you think state agencies put that into their planning? I would say that <clears throat> they did not. Okay. Um, and, and I think to be fair, their proliferation of AI and the complexity of AI wasn't really baked and matured as it is today, three years ago. Um, I think what we see, and I think one of the good things I see, is that a lot of the data that has been stored, and if, if you look at how much data am I using today? Now, there's data that's out there that suggests I'm only using 4 to 8% of the data I'm storing. So what am I doing with the other 96%? Right. And I think that and the AI models, and I think, and by the way, AI models have been around for a long time, right? But, you know, neural networks for how we communicate and networks has been around for a long time. So <clears throat> with that being said, I think that it's kind of exciting, I think, as an opportunity for state departments and agencies to actually be able to leverage and use a lot of that data that they could not historically use with AI. So um, I think it's going to be a cost that needs to be well thought out and structured and planned through the architecture of the data itself, right, and the governance of that data and what business problems I want to solve with that data and application of ethics of that and le legal and law application of that, whether we go for California Consumer Privacy Act and make sure we ensure we follow those items. I think there's going to be a proliferation of cost, but the great thing I think for California is that a lot of data, a lot of data has been stored and it's available for us to use. Well, I, I'm, we're going to talk about some of the, the state uses of the data and think through some of those issues, but I think it might be helpful for some of our .gov listeners to think about, Jen, how you, as a, as a private sector person, um, you had some foresight to, to appreciate the data expertise. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about how you two came to find each other? Yeah, I I think something that I heard often when I was in state government, and frankly, it was a lot of the times it was legislators asking it is like, what's the data behind this, right? Or what data do you have to back up these decisions you're making or these policies that you're putting in place? And sometimes we'd be like, uh, it's kind of sketchy. Like, I don't know, we've been collecting it for a little bit. It was like that, you know, 96% that we kept but wasn't used. Um, and I always have been very rational and very data driven. So to me, it was a little bit of walking the walk from a sales and a business development point of view. It's like, we always pushed on state government to use data to inform policy decisions. And that, as a citizen, is what I want to happen. Um, and here we are in the sales world, like throwing spaghetti at walls and hoping it sticks. It, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So when I'm talking with Athol about this and we're taking advantage of the transparency that government offers, and you can't do this really with when like when you're selling B2B because those businesses don't have to make their decisions public. Um, but when you're talking about governments, they do have to make them public and they are public and they're accessible. That data lives there. So uh, I put my head together with Athol and said, like, how, how can we use this to help the industry better target the state for what they need, right? What their business needs are so that when we're throwing that spaghetti, we're not throwing it at a wall. We're throwing it at, dart, at a dartboard and we know exactly where we need to go and we know what their problems are and we know the data that we have backs up the use case for whatever we're in there working with. Okay. So uh, I want to drill down just a little bit. I know why it makes sense. I want to, I'm curious how you how you knew the use case for it. So how did you bump into someone who could turn, it'd be great if we had to someone who understood data well enough to. Yeah. To I mean, he it. found me, honestly, okay. he was like, Hey, uh, well we cross paths. Athel sits on the board of an organization that I've worked with called women in data plug for women in data. It's fabulous. Everyone should join. 
but uh, I helped women in data and uh, I'm a lead of a chapter that focuses on California governments, um, the disparities of women in data jobs, diversity in data jobs is probably more pronounced in government, in my experience, even than in the private sector. So my idea was to bring a little bit of light to that and encourage people at the state uh, and the private sector to support those people at the state and in government to sort of pursue data as a career. Um, Athel sits on the board of that organization and said, hey, you know, we should chat about this. I've worked in government for 30 years. And let me tell you about what I've been working on and what I've been doing. And, you know, our paths crossed and I, you know, we went from there. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you some questions about how you do what you do. Um, but. It, it's tough. We don't want to talk about specific clients or different products, um, but I think uh, I think talking about a particular use case or how you uh, approach it might be help, more helpful for the audience to know how you do what you do or and maybe recreate it for themselves or 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 work with it. So we'll just take a big broad category like cloud expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? We all know that cloud expenditures are growing. We, it's uh, there's nobody involved in tech that doesn't know that the state spends more today than it did five years ago. What do you do with that data point and turn it into something useful for how you begin to think about sales to the government? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I worked in government, you know, and at the executive level, and one of the biggest things that frustrated me as a government employee was vendors just coming to try and sell me something, yes. right? Without understanding my problems and the value that you should bring to me. And, you know, it's something that I was very lucky um, that I had some great mentors. Uh, I will say they were females and they were amazing and they were uh, great mentors for me in allowing me to think more laterally on how we show value. So when we started looking at, when I look at the cloud and the cloud expenditure, I, I look at what, what is the problem we're going to solve and what are the services we need to provide? Uh, you know, if I'm sitting in that chair, right, what answers do I want to see as a CIO, CTO, CDO, or security officer, all those kind of things. So when I look at that data, and what I do is I, I look at the business problems we're going to solve and then I start building business models around that to uh, around that to look at the enhanced services and how much we're paying and, and all those kind of things. You know, one of the things that I find absolutely amazing is, you know, I look at all 50 states of data, right? Um, I don't just look at California. And so I know when maybe California is not getting the best deal on something. Um, what are you talking about? We're California. <laughs> we get the best deal on everything, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and often... Um, you know, I, I've worked as a consultant and on the coalface from from everything from a software engineer to tester to security specialist in the state agencies, many of the state departments. And there's a lot of hardworking folks out there that want to do the right thing. And I think we, we owe it to them from our role, you know, from Golden Bridge, is that we bring the right products to solve the right problems. So when I started looking at cloud expenditure, you know, I started looking at all the models and all the pricing and it was kind of interesting when I spoke to them and I spoke to Google, you know, I spoke to Oracle, I spoke to Azure and Microsoft because I want to hear from them, right, what their intent is. And that allowed me to add more weighting or more variations to the model to allow us to connect the dots to show the true cost, mm -hmm. right? So we might look at something and go, oh, that's free. Right, there are right. cloud vendors who go, oh no, you get that in the package. Well, nothing is free. Right. right. Um, so what's the total? It's cost? free to put it in. Yeah. So <laughs> it costs We're you a little something you a bill to get it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So not only do you want to look at the cost, but you want to look at really the total cost of ownership, right? So there is a cost to the state to implement something, you know. And if I have a platform and I have to retrain, you know, if I look at some agencies, they have 150 to 300 IT people. That's a lot of people to change, you know, and then I'm going to lose productivity. So what is the real value and the real cost? So when I look at the cloud and I look at the hybrid cloud, you know, and I look at the policies around the cloud and I look at the challenges, if you look at all the aspects of the model, 
you know, we're looking from privacy to governance to policy to security to security of sending the data through the network. People don't consider that, hey, I'm sending my data and it's encrypted when I store it, like your iPhone, that's encrypted, right? But what happens when it's going through the air or when it's going through the network? So looking at all those aspects allowed me to look at, to, to provide like a 360 degree view of the real cost of the solutions. And with that, you know, we can advise, you know, my job is to provide data for people to make an informed decision. And I want to make sure that data is as pure and as clean uh, as it can be uh, with what we have available. And once we have that, we have to have trust that the folks we're presenting that data to make the right decisions. Now, I've done it for state departments and customers, many of them, and I've done it for many commercial vendors. And... Um, it's kind of eye-opening, I think, when we have those first conversation. We had a, a meeting t earlier today, I'm not going to say who the vendor was, where we showed them 100,000 data points that we put together to, for them to actually prioritize and look at the value they could show to 20 accounts, right? Now, that's the power of having real data models, understanding the business problem and understanding the services we provide to provide real value to the state of California. And you make a really good point, though, when you talk about being a trusted advisor and a trusted source, because we're not just that to the vendors that we're working with. We're that to the government, too, because the ideal situation is a win-win. You know the department needs this. You know this is going to help their business process. And you're not only a trusted advisor to the vendor that you're working with, but you're also a trusted advisor to that CIO or chief data officer or director so that they know when you tell them, I've looked at everything, here's all the data, that they're making the most informed decision they can make too. Is there a way that you can compare uh, how different agencies or across departments are there uh, to find maybe a department that didn't implement as well and you could compare the data storage costs for one agency versus another? I do it all the time, but I'm not going to tell you the names. Of the <laughs> um, but We're not I, getting anyone in trouble here. Right, right. I will say there's an astronomical difference in cost and pricing. And, you know, and the, my concern is, yes, it's expensive to store this data that you don't need to store, right? Storing the same data in three different locations is a really good example, right? That's right. clearly not having a governance model or encapsulation or cataloging of your data with any level of maturity or guidance, right? Right. I would say that happens quite a bit. But I will say there are very advanced, um, very visionary organizations um, that do a great job on it. And, you know, some of them have made the commitment for chief data officers and they're really investing in understanding that this is not a technology problem, right? This is a business problem, right, that we're solving. And and I think those entities that do that will probably, I think, have a much more successful outcome of the value of the data they have. So, Jennifer, you talked about uh, that kind of information, maybe getting somebody in trouble. And and no one wants to be in, certainly not in a sales position. You don't want to put a department on blast or anything. But it seems like a great foundation for uh, a productive conversation like help it let us help you understand that you are spending way more uh, per gig of data than your sister agencies and here are some tools you can take where you might spend money for the tool but the your total IT spend is not really going to go anywhere. You're just going to spend it more efficiently in a better way and you'll have maybe more money because you're saving on your data, your data cost. I mean, I think that sort of, you know, to Athol's point, that portion of the data that isn't used, but frankly, it's going to be used in this new world of generative AI. Um most of it's a mess, honestly. <laughs> like, right. there's not governance around it. There's not hard rules around it. It hasn't been quality proofed and checked for accuracy. So, you know, and we've talked about it a number of times um, in our show here, garbage in, garbage out, right? right? The foundation of any generative AI model is going to be data. Right. So if you're pointing at garbage, 
you're going to get garbage. So I think getting our data house in order as a state, um, and Athel's right, there's incredible departments that are doing a lot of fabulous work here. And we've talked about a couple of them on the show. Um, but getting your data house in order, um, looking at governance at the structure around your data is something that I feel like most departments need to take a look at. I, I had a conversation with a senior uh, agency official just last night, and uh, he's, he wouldn't be a tech forward person, uh, tech aware, but not, not an expert. Uh, but he was talking about the rules they have, and they store way more data, and he believes they're storing way more data than is legally required. And people's default position is just to keep it when that's not, it's creating litigation problems or or difficulty and turns a, P, a, a P, PRA request into... Risk aversion, uh, right? A, a yeah. Risk averse. But in this case, you're risk averse, but the storing it longer is creating more risk for him. And, uh, and so I'm going to ask you a question. You used a phrase, data maturity. And the question I've got is I, we, we were working with a catalog with a, a state agency and, and finding information, a big chunk of the information that they used all the time was just a thin slice of what they had. And then a big chunk of the data they had had never been used in 15 years. And a catalog gave them a very clear picture. They still wanted to be able to search everything. When they used the catalog, everything came up, but they rec quickly recognized that everything they cared about was in this really narrow band. Uh, I don't know that that the catalog changed uh, or they've made all the changes in response to this new information, but the catalog made that little insight really plain to them, which gave them something. Um, when you talk about data maturity, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, and Jen talked about a little bit, it's about the quality and how the data is stored, right? And part of data maturity is, am I storing the right data? Do I have policy applied to it? And, and do I have encompassing the ability to have overall governance of the data? Because just like using data to make informed decisions, I need to make informed decisions about how I use my data. And, and that is one of the biggest gaps that we see today. So people, if I don't understand it, I'm going to say no and I'm going to store it. Okay. And it, that could go to any problem. It could be the network. It could be, you know, people being terrorized by, oh, I'm going to get ransomware and then they buy too much security. It could be anything, right? So, you know, in the technology space, what we don't see, and, and it, it's, not, it's not cool, right, to sit down and do a governance model of my data. <laughs> now, I love it, right, because that's what I do. You know, and I've, I've been very lucky to meet with some amazing people on data and see the value of it. But if you take the time and you have a true, you know, sort of a data strategy and you have governance model and encapsulation and cataloging of the data, then the true cost of the data will go down. And But more importantly, the true value of what I can get from that data will go significantly up. And we don't need to apply AI to do that. We just need to apply a bit of common sense. <laughs> we need that on a coffee mug. We don't, <laughs> we don't need AI to do that. We just need a bit of common sense. Uh, when I think about the data maturity and, and data governance, every agency has, uh, if I ask, they would say, yes, we have a data governance policy. They've, somebody wrote one, they've all been through an exercise and, um, and they might think they've got a data uh, process. Do you think a a neutral assessment, a self assessment of data maturity and sort of comparison across agencies makes sense? Uh, I think some help. You know, I, I if I look at an analogy of what we've done with cybersecurity over the years, cybersecurity was like it was like the wild west when it first started ten years ago. Right, we had all kinds of products and it would do everything for you, and and I think that. You know, the creation of entities, and I'm not part of it at all, but entities like CalSecure and AB2814 and those things that actually created some structure to help those organizations who need help, who don't realize that how much help they need. Right. Now, you can't go out and hire 
you know, the top security guys are $400,000 a year, right? That's unrealistic. So let's give people a framework to help them be successful. I think that having that framework to have the ability to have an assessment for a, a, a maturity model of my data and how I get to the next step rather than, you know, we see people talking about AI and I, this happens to me all the time, right? Because I'm in data, you know, everyone's like, well, you know, we've got AI, so what are we going to do next? I'm like, well, what are you doing now? <laughs> right. And they're like, well, what do you mean? What are we doing now? Well, you can't just jump from level one to level five in a CMMI model, right? You have to have a well thought out strategy and plan to increase your maturity of how you store, how you use and who's using the data and the legal ethics that go with it and all those kind of things. And I think if you do that, I think if, if we provided people a framework that they could do two things, it'd be nice if they could self-assess, right? That would be really good because, at, you know, as a when I worked in the government, any opportunity that I got to self-assess, I took it because I would rather deal with my own stuff internally rather than have some external entity publish how bad I'm doing, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just trying to keep it real in, in an area that it, how it would be successful. And I think the other area is that I think that if entities had the ability to reach out to an organization to help them with guidance and assessment and strategy and planning and recommendations for data frameworks and data models, I think it would be incredibly valuable to those smaller organizations. And I spend a lot of time with our cities, you know, and there are some cities, they, they face the same problems. You know, if you take the biggest agencies that's, that spend money here in the state of California, well, the cities who have, you know, way less money have the same problem. So how do they solve it? They're really clever at maximizing how they do it, reaching out and working on a network and creating a peer network, creating user groups, uh, creating cohorts, creating foundational frameworks that are shared across counties. And I think it would be incredibly valuable for the state to have something like that that people can leverage and use and maybe have it anonymous, right? And then if I need help, I've got somewhere to go for help and I don't have to go out and pay a, a crazy amount of money for consultants to actually create something that is kind of out there already. Well, uh, we've, we've definitely gone over, but I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on. It seems I've identified different different layers that we could we could plumb. Is there anything else Just you wanted to bring I'll, up on I'll this episode? toss up a parting question that I've sort of been thinking about. And you did draw some parallels to cybersecurity. And, you know, every department now has a CISO, a chief information security officer, um, we've seen a chief data officer at the state level, positions vacant right now, hoping for an appointment. But do you think, you know, 10 years from now, looking back to how cybersecurity evolved, do you think that that's where data is heading so that we'll have a network of chief data officers at, you know, a data officer at every department? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll see chief data and AI officer. I think that's what we'll see. I think you can't ignore... AI, even though it's kind of like the hot buzzword, it's been around for a while, but but I think the models and just the pure acceleration, you know, I follow this weekly and it's incredible changes on a weekly basis. It's almost very difficult to keep up with the growth and maturity of it. But I would hope that for the value of the state and everybody else that, that they do have the right chief data and AI officers in place and they have the a seat at the table to support the business and the, and the citizens of California. Well, thank you for coming on the show, being our uh, inaugural guest. Uh, I know I got a lot out of it. I'm going to trust that. Uh, yep. I'm going to trust that our audience will too. Thank you for your expertise. Thanks for having me.